Hello and welcome to this uh, brief overview of NMR spectroscopy. We're going to cover the basic theory, so we'll talk about how nuclear spin arises and how an NMR spectrometer makes use of this, what the NMR spectrum tells us, why we use a tetramethylsilane um, as a reference, and the significance of the hydrogen isotope deuterium in NMR spectroscopy before going very quickly through what the key parts of a spectrum are to look for when analysing it. So the clip won't cover worked questions or how to lay out a detailed analysis. It's mainly attended as a quick review or a quick introduction. So first of all, let's look at nuclear spin. If a nucleus has an odd number of nucleons, in other words, the total protons plus neutrons is an odd number, it will spin in the presence of a magnetic field. So this is because nuclei are positively charged, and like other charged objects, they respond to the presence of a magnetic field. What this causes them to do is to move from their ground state, which is lower energy, to the excited state, which is higher energy. So basically, the energy difference between these two states will match the environment that the hydrogen atom will find itself in. So we're talking about hydrogen atoms in particular here. So basically, the energy difference, or delta E, will match the uh, specific hydrogen environment that it's responding to. So let's take a brief look inside an NMR spectrometer. You don't need to know the details of this um, in great depth for the specification, but the two things you need to remember is that uh, the spectrometer will subject a sample to a magnetic field to make the nuclei spin in the first place, and radio frequency radiation. Um, to excite them as outlined in the last screen. So the radio frequency radiation provides the energy to make them go from the ground state to the excited state and back again. So each environment has a signature energy difference between the ground and excited state of the nuclei in it. Or should I specifically say, in this particular case, the hydrogen nuclei in it. So it's important just to think about the nuclei we're talking about. In this particular clip we're talking about proton NMR spectroscopy, so hydrogen nuclei. So an environment is basically where a uh, hydrogen atom in a molecule might be found. And uh, the data sheet, or the part of the data sheet that refers to the hydrogen NMR chemical shifts relative to TMS, uh, is provided here. We'll talk in a second about what TMS actually is. So each of the peaks in a spectrum will match along the chemical shift scale one of the environments here. What you need to be able to do is match them up as part of your analysis. So I mentioned tetramethylsilane, or TMS, in passing a couple of minutes ago. This is used as a standard against which all of the environments in your sample can be compared by the, uh, the spectrometer. So there's a number of advantages to this particular compound. Most of them are to do with its practicality and its health and safety aspects. But it also gives a strong singlet, so no splitting of the peak. So that's what we're going to talk about next. So what happens uh, when something, uh, when a peak is split? It's caused by the different orientations in the nucleus. So they can spin with or against the magnetic field that we talked about a bit earlier. The more hydrogen an environment, the more hydrogen atoms, the greater the combination of these two possibilities. However, if you've got two hydrogens, they could have three possible combinations, both against, both with, or one against and one with. So three hydrogen nuclei could spin with all three with, all three against, two with, one against, two against, one with. So this causes the peak to split. If there's one hydrogen atom in the adjacent environment, the peak splits into two. If there's two hydrogen atoms, in the adjacent environment, the peak splits into three. If there's three hydrogens in the adjacent environment, the peak splits into four. On the next screen I'll explain to you what I mean by adjacent environment. So let's look at a very simple example like ethanol. I brought the, uh, uh, the data sheet into the bottom of the screen for you. So let's try and explain what's going on here. You can see that there's a splitting going on. Um, there's a triplet at 1.2 and there's a quartet at uh, 3.6. So what's going on with the splitting? 
So what you have to do is consider the environment adjacent. So what happens is that the peak is split into the number of protons in the adjacent environment plus one. So we call this the n plus one rule and it needs to be applied in your analysis. So let's do a very quick uh, roundup of the things that your analysis should contain. I've listed them down the left hand side so we'll go through what each of them actually tells you. So the chemical shift value gives the general hydrogen environment as found on the data sheet. And to do this, what you do is cross-reference the location of the peak um, on your spectrum to the data sheet. This gives the number of non-equivalent hydrogens in the adjacent environment to the one that the, um, the peak comes from. And what you do is use the n plus 1 rule. So therefore, a singlet means that there's no hydrogens in the adjacent environment because 0 plus 1 makes 1. A doublet means there's two, uh, sorry, one hydrogen in the adjacent environment because 1 plus 1 makes 2. A triplet means that there are uh, two hydrogens in the adjacent environment. 2 plus 1 makes 3. A quartet means that there are three hydrogens in the adjacent environment. 3 plus 1 makes 4. So the relative peak areas may or may not be provided in the question, but if they are, you need to do something with them. What they tell you is the number of hydrogens in the actual environment you're looking at. So the final part is perhaps the most uh, difficult part. You look at the general environments that you've um, located using your data sheet and then apply these across to your molecule. You'll have some information about it and you'll be able to try and deduce what they might be. By this stage, you'll have already got a few marks, so don't worry if you get to this point and get stuck. Okay, so let's have a look at the data sheet just to remind ourselves what part of it we're going to be using. So we use deuterium or deuterated solvents to check whether the special singlet or single peak you get for OH and NH groups actually shows they are present. So deuterium has two nucleons, so it does not spin in the presence of a magnetic field. So therefore the number of nucleons is even. So two spectra are run, one with the sample and a second with the sample shaken with D2O or heavy water. This replaces all the H atoms in the above highlighted environments with D atoms. So therefore no more spin, so the peaks disappear. And therefore that confirmed the presence of these environments. So the sample may also be dissolved in another solvent that has deuterium, CdCl3, which is a uh, a little bit like uh, a trichloromethane, except it's got C, uh, D instead of H in it. So the solvent itself doesn't interfere with the spectrum in the first place. So let's have a quick review of some of the proton animal ideas we've been covering. So the splitting pattern tells us how many protons are in the adjacent environment. So let's say we take the CH3 on the left-hand side. So we have uh, three protons in that environment, as you can see. But in the adjacent environment, there are two protons. So what this means is you get a splitting pattern of a, a triplet. So a triplet comes from that CH3 as the n plus 1 rule is applied to the two hydrogens next door. But if we were to take those two hydrogens in that CH2 group and call that our environment, the adjacent environment is the CH3. So this time there are three hydrogens next door, so you get a quartet as our splitting pattern. But on the CH3 group next to the ester functional group, there are no hydrogens on the adjacent environment, so this time a singlet is applied. So the adjacent environment would obviously be the oxygen atom that I've highlighted in, in uh, grey. So the integration ratio tells us how many protons are in the actual environment we're looking at. So it's a 3 to 2 to 3 ratio of the protons in the three different environments we've just looked at. So D2O, if you remember, is used to uh, eliminate from the spectrum the presence of OH and NH groups. Because what happens is the peaks disappear if the sample is run a second time with a deuterated solvent. So remembering that deuterium, being an isotope of hydrogen, has an extra neutron in its nucleus, so it's got two nucleons instead of one. So it's an even number. So hence no spin and therefore no NMR signal.
So let's now look at a couple of uh, quick summary questions, not exam questions as such, but just something to, to round up what we've been talking about. So it's worth pausing the clip at this point and see if you can grab a uh, scrap piece of paper and uh, just write down something to answer each of these, just to test out your understanding. See if you can do it without your notes or without any help, and I'd say give yourself five minutes. And then come back and check and we'll have a look at the answers together. So looking at the first uh, three questions, the first question is basically um, connected to the fact that nuclei with odd numbers of nucleons possess spin in response to radio waves or radio frequency radiation. The second question relates to the fact that deuterium has an even number of nucleons, so it's not picked up as a signal. So it can either be used as a reference, uh, tetramethylthylene, which is the third question's answer, or it can be used as a solvent itself in its own right. The most common solvent used is uh, CdCl3. So the third question, uh, basically TMS stands for tetramethylsilane. All the proton environments are the same, so it gives you a singlet at chemical shift value zero. So if we move the page down a bit to look at question number four, you can see there's two different ways of looking at it. Now the the uh, splitting patterns is a little bit outside the remit of this clip. I mentioned it in passing earlier. So the splitting pattern is the application of the n plus 1 rule. And obviously in low resolution NMR spectroscopy, the n plus 1 rule is not applied. And just to highlight the area under the peaks again, uh, it represents the ratios in which the hydrogen atoms are found in the different environments. So looking at the structure of ethanol, we can do what we talked about a little bit earlier. So we can look at the number of hydrogens in each environment, and that represents the area under the peak, also called the integration trace. If we were to now apply the n plus 1 rule, you'd get those three um, splitting patterns, like you can see in the high-resolution version at the top of the screen. So starting with the singlet, the adjacent environment is an oxygen. There are no hydrogen atoms attached to it, so 0 plus 1 equals 1. So here on the purple highlighted hydrogens, there's three hydrogen atoms in the adjacent environment. 3 plus 1 equals 4. So on the red highlighted um, environment, there are two hydrogen atoms on the adjacent environment. 2 plus 1 equals 3, so triplet. OK, so that brings us to the end of this, uh, this summary of uh, some of the theory behind NMR. Hopefully it's been a useful introduction or perhaps a useful review. And uh, thanks for your time and see you soon.